Welcome back to uh, another Shifted podcast. Um, I'm so happy to have Bo Stern Thompson, uh, Thompson here um, from the Leg- Lego Education, uh, Head of Education Impact is his title. Um, and I just so I've been waiting for this conversation for so long because you and I jive on play. Um, play is my game. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So, Bo, thanks so much for, for hopping on here and, and talking to us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a, it's a really exciting topic that is very dear and near to my heart. So uh, thank you for, for making these podcasts. Great. Well, Bo, I love these kind of like laying the foundation a little bit. Um, how did you come into working with, with Lego Education? Um, like, what was that moment where you either found the job, offered the job, uh, found it through people. Can you kind of fill those lines in as to how you came into Lego Education? Absolutely, yeah. So um, my background is and my aspiration uh, throughout my life has been around designing, playing, building, making things. So uh, I was originally uh, a designer and architect by background. Um, and I figured out that actually being creative and designing things is some of the most effective ways to learn because you're really trying to figure things out. You're trying to come up with new ideas. Uh, you really persevere through challenging problems and so forth. So throughout uh, my education career, I uh, had a PhD in technology and learning, which brought my awareness to MIT Media Lab and you know the development of digital learning technologies that are more constructivist, more creative. Um, and after studying that and doing a, a trajectory around robotics, um, uh, I was uh, looking at something called the Lego Learning Institute uh, in the Lego company. So the Lego company has had for a decade or so uh, a learning institute to bring together uh, research experts and educators to really shape how we can do the best for children in the Lego Lego company. So I came into the Lego uh, company uh yeah, almost 15 years ago, uh, to lead that Lego Learning Institute to better figure out how we can uh, create uh, better experiences for children. Uh, but that has been grown over the past 15 years. So being head of research in the Lego Foundation to bring together expertise and examples on this relationship between play and learning, which sometimes can be a little controversial, but in from a science point of view, from a child's point of view, is completely natural. So now what I'm doing in, in Lego Education is try to scale that ability to fully integrate uh, uh, playful learning into uh, the classroom and to educate the uh, natural ways of uh, teaching. And well, what? How did you play as a kid? Just curious. Like, do you remember times of play when you were young, growing up, that marked you as as a human? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, most people, when we speak about play, can recall these moments where they had the freedom or the agency to test and try things out. Uh, usually it's sometimes with friends or it's a particular sport you have or hobby you have. My, uh, you know, uh, passion for play was brought around a lot of freedom and agency to explore nature. I grew up in a quite remote area of Denmark uh, where I had opportunities to build and make things in the forest or in my garden. Uh, And then I did a lot of sports. So really this opportunity to give freedom and support and trust in in building small things with wooden things and materials uh, all playing uh, playing a little bit, obviously, with Lego bricks also, uh, as we had that at home. But it's it's really this idea to to build and make things that was foundational in my in my childhood. I love to see your connections to outdoors as well, because oftentimes when I ask teachers about, can you recall your childhood play? It always connected back to nature somehow. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you find that that has changed um, how kids play nowadays than it did, you know, a couple decades ago? I think the research is pretty clear that the uh, children's. Uh, uh, domains of play has, has changed. Um, so uh, when we study how children move around the neighborhoods and in cities, it's been uh, um, smaller distances, uh, more close neighborhoods, uh, and most of that kind of freedom and, and exploration have moved to digital spaces. Um, so, so I think what we are seeing right now is that 
children still play and explore and meet friends and take risks and so forth. But it's in spaces that is a little more difficult to uh, relate to because uh, they jump between different kind of social networks and digital spaces. So, so I think there's certainly opportunities to remind ourselves that the physical play and the, you know, the physical environment and the hands-on learning is still important. And we see a lot of opportunities to blend that more and more. And also to emphasize that actually there are good forms of uh, digital engagement that benefits children a lot when they are creative and social. Uh, so so it's it's important to kind of have a more nuanced perspective on how play has changed and really how different ways that children still benefit from it. And at Lego Education, what's your mindset around play? Or like, how, how do you guys define what play is when you are thinking about um, the learning process um, and, and the tools that you bring into this and creative tools being Lego? How do you see play? Like, what is your definition for for Lego as they look through that lens at play? That's a really good question and something we really have spent a lot of time and work with our research network educators to formulate what that looks like. So play is, uh, you know, always uh, important and always a benefit. And if you look at the research on children's uh, play, it's a main mechanism of how they develop and learn. So because we have a lot of uncertainty and children, you know, don't know to walk and talk and like, you know, math and language, they just throw themselves into it, right? They experiment, they jump out from high, uh, from, from heights and they try to turn around the, the plants in the house and so forth because playing is a mechanism to explore the unknown and to learn about the world. At the same time as they learn to socialize, to keep attention, to learn about math by manipulating objects, to learn about language, to do role play. That form of play, you know, is a lot about individual agency and about having choices and freedom. But that to fit into education systems, what we have uh, identified is that a few things that needs to be in place to make that work in a collaborative, more outcome focused environment. Uh, so play is still important, but it's more like a guided play. Uh, and the reason why it, this can become more relevant right now is because we have realized education systems are teaching children the same thing in the same way at the same time. So basically, everyone are treated the same. And there's quite a lot of stress being built up, a lack of belonging, uh, lack of uh, support uh, for children with very different needs also. And this is where play really can benefit uh, that opportunity that we actually have much broader outcomes and expectations to what our education systems should deliver. So we need education systems that have like a fundamental you know, well-being approach that deliver towards the outcomes, uh, you know, in terms of mathematics and, and, and language and, and science and so forth. But also that the new reality of education is that children need to be more creative and supported in their resilience and collaboration and critical thinking. And that's where play comes into play, basically. But it's not play as we think about it as just the freedom of choosing whatever you do, but more guided play. Guided play means that as an educator, you still set the outcomes. You say, like, we're going to teach about mathematics right now. Uh, or we're going to teach about the language of a particular book. So you set the outcomes and you do that through an approach that could be similar to inquiry. Like you have a big question that you prompt children with. Uh, I wonder why, how this uh, bicycle moves uphill and how it gains energy. Or uh, I wonder what this uh, character in the book might look like or could be different. So educators would guide the kind of learning objective and the, uh, uh, and the uh, starting point of a lesson. But then they give children choices. So, for instance, I say, like, this particular book, I've read a little bit about the introduction. How might it continue? And children go into individuals and groups to explore how might that story look different and what are the characters? Or they ask to say, you know, I wonder how what gravity actually is. I wonder how we can make things turn upside down. And they invite children to build different modes of balancing mechanisms where they can test out gravity. So... For us, that's really a guided play approach because you set expectations, you have to deliberate focus on uh, materials that are relevant to that learning outcome. But children within the first five, 10 minutes are given agency and choice to explore that topic. What research indicates is 
children actually not only learn about the mathematics and the language and the science much deeper, they remember it much better because they have hands-on materials that relate to the particular topic that are being taught, but also because they have choices. They can actually develop their own ideas. And if educators then bring back uh, to a classroom discussion, you know, okay, how did these characters actually look like? How might the story end? Or what are the different ways that um, that uh, gravity looks like or balance looks like? Children have so many different ways of seeing that and expressing it. So they remember it for longer, but they also are supported in their creativity to come up with different ideas that critical things need to reflect on whether this is gravity or not, and the ability to be engaged because they had much more ability to uh, make abstract concepts concrete and observe, observe and, 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 and see it. So, so basically, play has often been thought of as like free play and then instruction where you have to sit still and look. And we are creating this dichotomy between these two, but actually the most effective ways of learning is a balance in between. It's a guidance. Uh, and it's something we can use in education systems, but also generally in our in our workplace uh, that we give more agency and focus and support creativity and collaboration, but it's within the scope of the outcomes we're hoping to achieve. Great, great. Well, so uh, wise words there. I mean, really loving what you're saying both. Um, now, as we move higher up into the levels, into, you know, middle school, high school, play evolved. Um, but you, you did this study where you looked at different kinds of digital play tools where you could um, tinker and iterate. Um, and those were particularly Scratch, um, Minecraft, and also the, Mind, the Lego Mindstorm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that evolution that play can continue in like it's not just um, held in kindergarten or preschool, that this playfulness, this choice, this agency can have legs throughout all of one's learning, you know, career. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk to a little bit about those schools and how they can be integrated into a higher school in and still maintain that playfulness? Absolutely. And I think that's a very good point. And that's something that we should emphasize much more that play exists, you know, all across from early childhood into school into adulthood. And the characteristics that aligns with that type of uh, play that children learn and develop through play is it needs to be actively engaging. Like you need to be able to physically uh, represent things uh, that you are being taught you need to have choices. You need to be active in making choices. Uh, it needs to be opportunities to test and try out different ideas. We call it iteration. There's not only one way of just saying, this is kind of a solution, now figure out how we got there. Uh, or it's meaningful. It's something that relates to children's passion and their interest, not just something that is in the curriculum, but how do we relate the curriculum to interest. So there's a few key characteristics about that support for curiosity and like how might we do this and that's actually similar to whether you're a young child in school or whether you're an adult it's the same kind of characteristics we ask in our workplace are you actively engaged or are you passively sitting observing is it meaningful to what your capabilities are and what you're interested in or is this something you have to do just because you know we have to get it done um so these characteristics, um, you know, are similar all across age groups, but we need to support it with different types of materials. So what the Lego system does as the Lego bricks and the system is, you know, at the young ages, you have Lego Duplo, you have large bricks uh, that you can easily manipulate uh, as a young child. Actually, then you have the Lego system, the smaller bricks that fits on top of the Duplo. And then you have like increasingly more advanced uh, building systems like Technique. You have more advanced uh, use of uh, robot motors and sensors and so forth. So basically, the point is to build a system that is have a low floor. It's easy for people to get started, young children, but a high ceiling, which means that anyone can keep building, creating something more and more complex, keep being challenged, even when you get into higher education or where you really want to engage in a really difficult um, uh, challenge as a, as a, as a grown-up. That kind of mindset as a creative system that support a child and adult at their level and keeps growing with the, with the, with the person was Gottfried Kier Christensen's uh, vision, the second generation uh, Lego family member. And it's the same way to think about digital technologies also. So when we looked at these characteristics and said, 
how does these characteristics of play actually align with educational systems? It actually exists in many different types of approaches, like problem-based learning or project-based learning, where you should build a physical prototype of something, or inquiry, where you explore an idea, um, or experiential learning, where you go out and find a topic that's interesting, or visit a site and so forth. But there hasn't been a lot of ways to scale and systematize it. So then we have now say, well, actually, through guided play, we can provide the right materials for the right learning objective and then give children opportunities to explore that. And if you do that in the digital world, it is much more like, uh, you know, Minecraft or the Scratch community for coding, where you not only have the coding platform or the online platform to build and make things, but you provide that scaffolding to say how we might build the tallest tower and see what would it take when it falls. Uh, or how might we create our little own village that you find meaningful to live in and how would you relate to your neighborhoods? So basically provide these guidance in these open-ended platforms that provides a support for learning objectives. And I, I see this in the evolution of the Mindstorm into the spike where it seems like there was a shift in mindset a little bit um, at Lego. Um, is that is that accurate to say, Bo? Do you, do you, is, was there a conscious decision to kind of keep like a little bit more open-ended and more manipulation of the parts could be interchanged? And um, is that is that accurate? It is. Um, like the, the Lego Education has been around for 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And we started based on the MIT Media Labs uh, collaboration on, uh, you know, uh, constructionism, children to create ideas that are meaningful and can collaborate on them, and then became Mind, Mind Storms, which was based on a book from uh, Seymour Papert, became the first product that explored this kind of open-ended approach to, to learning. And we have gradually evolved that from uh, Mind Storms towards uh, Spike, that is a Lego education product right now. Uh, the, the key thing that keeps evolving for us is getting closer and closer to this being easier for educators to facilitate uh, in the classrooms and a part of lessons. So not only is it now based on the science of learning, it's a guided play approach. It makes it easy for educators to get started in five, 10 minutes, but they can actually facilitate these types of activities within 45 minutes, one hour. And the key things that make that work is they are aligned to uh, standards and learning objectives. So educators can see, ah, if I'm going to teach this kind of concept of uh, gravity, emotion, a force, and so forth, you know, this is actually a physical manipulative I can use. It's then simple for them to use. So there's a presentation they can use, and they get the prompts with questions, and they easily get supporting, can support uh, students to represent these ideas uh, in, in groups. Um, and they can, you know, conclude the lesson by children sharing the ideas and experiments and talk about the concepts and principles that are there. So it's relevant, it's simple, and it's uh, it's uh, inherently child-led in the sense of giving agency and, and opportunity to explore that. So, so yeah, I think we have learned that it needs to be open-ended, but it needs to be sufficiently structured in the beginning so educators know they're achieving the outcomes, and it's actually... It's not too, it's not chaotic. It's not complex like with traditional or creative approaches where you have to bring different types of crayons and, and uh, Play Doh together and, 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 and hope for the best. But it allows them um, to build towards the objective, take it apart and pack, and, and, and pack it into the, into, under, to the shelves again. Okay. <clears throat> and like, what advice do you give teachers to get going with it? Because you kind of touched on something that until a teacher feels, um, comfortable with you know whatever they're bringing in tactile where it's more open-ended and less structured it kind of gets uh, teachers get anxious a bit um when you are bringing in lego with content connections what kinds of tips do you give to teachers to kind of get their mindset around that i don't have to be in charge of it all i can offload some of this stuff and the kids are still learning because oftentimes I think teachers think, oh, it's just an extra thing I have to do or I don't have time for that. Um, can you speak to some, some advice you give teachers on, on the benefits of integrating and, and maybe a little bit of the struggles they'll feel, but it's okay? Absolutely. We've, we've had uh, quite a lot of uh, conversations with educators from all over the world, also done a, quite a lot of studies around it. 
Um, the main thing that is difficult for an educator and for an adult in any situation, sometimes for a parent, is the risk of failing. Like, you know, teachers want to see that children succeed. They want to see engagement. Uh, they want to know that they are scaffolding the child to be more and more uh, competent in any of the topics they do. And they are usually afraid of new approaches where it's more difficult for them to to get familiar with these approaches when they have been taught in, in a different way. So the first thing is to acknowledge that they actually need to take risks and experiment with the materials. Uh, so giving opportunities for them to go hands-on and try materials and they realize that actually this approach to understanding mathematics or science is actually more effective because children would be able to articulate this better, these notions and concepts and so forth when they get it hands-on. But they actually they need to try it themselves. So our teacher professional development workshop starts very hands-on and reflections around that kind of fear of failure. Um, the way that the scaffolded is around giving teachers confidence that you're achieving the learning outcomes. Uh, so you are actually teaching towards the standards and outcomes and objectives. You can literally see it among the children much more practically, but you can see that demonstrating force and gravity or articulating a language of a book and so forth. So you actually have a better, you know, almost like a real-time assessment in the classroom compared to children sitting passively. Uh, it also very important in the times we're in right now for educators to minimize preparation time. So what we've been trying to do is to say, well, these are the outcomes, these are the materials, these are presentations you can use. So give confidence to this being something that relates to children's interests and passions. And you actually have some support for guiding that in the classroom. So it doesn't get messy and complex but they are guided through, uh, through, the, through the lesson plans. So, so I think that's kind of the, this kind of be mindful that, that sometimes it's kind of that uncertainty or the mindset of failing that, that keeps, uh, uh, keeps uh, being a, the barrier, but we're providing scaffolding in terms of the outcomes and facilitation all along. I think at the end of the day, what we have seen is, particularly right now, um, educators as well as administrators and others are seeing disengagement. Like, Children are not necessarily excited to go to school, at least not to learn. Um, they don't necessarily feel a sense of belonging. They don't feel they're challenged, uh, and they may not even utilize technologies in the best way. So, so it is addressing kind of a, a key gap we're seeing right now that not only are children not necessarily learning the most effective ways, but they're, they're definitely not engaged uh, in school. Uh, so leaning into that kind of main objective of what educators was hoping for when they become a teacher was to see engagement and joy of learning and excitement and collaboration. And that's really what you can see when you bring in hands-on learning. I totally agree with you. I love the idea too that let the teachers try it first. Give them some time yeah. to explore and have mm -hmm. that anxiousness happen. Get it mm -hmm. out of your system. And then they come to the realization that hmm, maybe I was thinking too much about this. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. just a matter of getting going with it. Um. So well, just to kind of bring things to a close here again, thanks so much for um, taking a bit of time out of your day. I mean, we could just talk on and on and on. I know um, I have a million questions, but <laughs> we'll stick to the, the time frame. Um, AI is now um, becoming more and more of a, 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 an issue in schools, and we're talking more about it. Um, you recently put uh, something out how AI transforms education in 2023. Um, looking at how it's more equitable and um, inclusive learning. Um, how do you see the future of education that, that has an AI lens? That's a very good question. Yeah, and thank you for, for mentioning, so, mentioning some of these uh, resources here. Um, with any kind of new technologies, it's always challenging in the beginning, I would say. And the first and foremost uh, in our work right now is safety and security because we're dealing with children, we are dealing with uh, data sometimes that children take from the internet uh, and educators trying to figure out good sources. So most of our fundamental work is on responsible innovation and digital play. Uh, so we work with a range of different experts to make sure that uh, we are not asking to save data and expose data and so forth. So that's fundamental in AI because AI has not been trained on, on, on what children learn the best. But then I think what we're seeing as a beginning shift is hands-on learning becomes more important because much more is getting digital. 
And what I mean is that when you begin to have much more automation and prompting things with AI, you know, getting not only knowledge, but discussions with uh, technologies, people will be longing for and what we're seeing for hands-on real life experiences. That's what AI cannot generate. They can't generate that kind of relationship to something you are truly passionate about, the relationship to what actually happens in the classroom. So there's a point of confusion right now in terms of what are the best materials to use and how can we use it, what are we allowed to use? But if you lean into that form of safe experimentation, which we're doing right now, I believe we'll come to a point in three, four years where actually AI was greatly help our ability to scale the forms of learning that we are most excited about, like guided play, inquiry-based, problem-based, project-based learning. So actually the forms of learning where you're asking difficult questions in terms of knowledge and expertise areas, but then you are giving opportunities through processes of addressing a problem with physical materials or creating a project that's meaningful for you to, to create a real-life project to work with the community, which AI cannot do. So not only administratively, but really helping to facilitate a really good learning process. So I think we'll get there right now. Right now, it's a matter of supporting educators and communities to find good ways of uh, of integrating that in, in their work. And, uh, and when it's really helpful, I think that that period will come soon. I mean, I compare it sometimes to a, the calculator. When the calculator first came in, like we could get rid of these mundane additions and multiplications that took time. Like AI yeah. seems to be able to like get us to places quicker. Um, but yeah, it won't tell you it loves you. Um, <laughs> it won't <be> your friend. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's the good analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Well, Bo, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for for joining us here today um some of your words have just been really um reflectionary and i'll have to think about it as i re-listen um but thanks again this has been uh, great uh, and i hope we do this again one time i have so much more we could uh, we could talk about absolutely it would be my pleasure thank you so much for doing this thank you